Hello, everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. And in this lesson, number 126, I'll be addressing the question I've lately been receiving quite a bit. Is SOA, Service Oriented Architecture, dead? You can get a listing of all of my videos in Software Architecture Monday, including a description of them as well as resources, and even view them within my website uh, by going to my website at uh, developer2architect.com slash lessons, or just click the lessons link. Uh, most of my lessons uh, in Software Architecture Monday are based on two books I've recently written uh, with my friend Neil Ford, and that is The Fundamentals of Software Architecture, and also, now released, uh, in paper, in print, and ebook, uh, Software Architecture, The Hard Parts. Uh, I want to offer another reference, and here's a link on the QR code, uh, for another book I wrote a couple years ago, Microservices Versus Service-Oriented Architecture. Uh, a good reference to really see the differences between these two architectural styles. Uh, like I just said, I have been getting this question um, is service-oriented architecture dead? Does anybody even use this thing anymore? Is this one of those things that we tried and decided not to do? <laughs> well, I'm dying to answer that question and address that question, at least in my opinion. Uh, but first, I thought it would be fun to take the opportunity in this lesson to really describe service-oriented architecture as an architectural style, because it still is an architectural style. Uh, Service-oriented architecture had its heyday in the early 2000s when I started to use SOA. And let me describe uh, some of the aspects of this architectural style. Um, there's a very strict taxonomy of service types that exist with SOA. And it all starts with what are called business services. These are coarse-grained, abstract services that business users and owners defined. Uh, things, for example, like processing a claim, executing a trade, placing an order. Uh, these were things that business users said, this is what I need to do. Hence, it became a business service. And these are the inputs, things I'm going to give you. And this is what I'm expecting to get back. So it included a name with a contract for inputs and outputs. And those were specified by business users. So they're very abstract services. They were implemented through enterprise services, which were coarse-grained, concrete services uh, that were available to be shared across the organization. Things like checking compliance, for example, creating a customer, uh, calculating a quote, all these things that could be shared uh, by multiple systems within our organization. Now, enterprise services was another type that relied on a third type of service in our taxonomy, which were called application services. Uh, these were services that were very fine-grained and were scoped to a particular application context. For example, within insurance, uh, maybe the act of adding a driver or adding another vehicle or uh, getting the, some trade details, for example. These are, these are some of the examples of what an application service would look like. More fine-grained, generally not shared across the organization, but scoped to a particular application. And then finally, infrastructure services, which were shared like enterprise services across the organization. Uh, things that most systems needed to do, for example, writing audit logs, uh, doing security, checking authentication, error handling, stuff like that. And then, of course, we all can't forget the main factor or piece of SOA, which was the very large enterprise service bus, which acted as the glue bringing all that stuff together. And it did a few things. <laughs> Again, I'm joking about the few. Uh, the enterprise service bus or message bus part of SOA is what provided all that level of its abstraction. I mean, this did message enhancement, message transformation, protocol transformation. It decoupled contracts, allowing me to make a restful request to quote the system to invoke maybe some COBOL code in a mainframe, some code in RPG, let's say in an AS400, or even other kinds of platforms. As a matter of fact, this is where the service registry functionality contains. Security, things like choreography and orchestration both existed in different contexts and different definitions within the enterprise service bus. 
So that kind of briefly describes service-oriented architecture as an architectural style. Uh, it's fairly complex and had a lot of these formal constructs. Well, it was overly complex. And so as an industry, what happened was we started to morph the definition of service-oriented architecture and redefine it as web services. And web services started to say, oh, it's the same thing as SOA. And that's what started to lead to the demise of service-oriented architecture. It wasn't necessarily web services, but rather a lack of understanding about how this thing worked and what it should do. So, interesting. Let's come back now to our question. Is service-oriented architecture dead? In my opinion, the answer is no. It's not dead. It's not used a lot because of all the lessons learned that we experienced through service-oriented architecture. And as a matter of fact, uh, let me show you one of those lessons. And then I'm actually going to justify and tell you why I don't think SOA is completely dead yet. <laughs> it still is a viable architecture. However, let's take a look at the shape of this architecture. When we talk about domain to architecture isomorphism, each architectural style has its own shape. And the shape of SOA is core functionality that's shared across multiple enterprise systems. And that sharing happens through abstraction via an enterprise service bus. That's the overall shape. And as a matter of fact, this shape really was one of the things that caused the demise of service-oriented architecture. That first lesson learned was the fact that reuse, which was one of the main tenets of service-oriented architecture across the enterprise, didn't work as well as we expected. <laughs> as a matter of fact, in our book, The Fundamentals of Software Architecture, we did the star ratings that we did for all other architecture styles for SOA as well. One star being mm, not really well supported, five stars being really well supported. And as you notice, we've got a lot of five stars with SOA. But you can also observe we have a lot of single stars. And so let's analyze this question. Is it dead? No, it's still a viable architecture style. Well, if no one's using it, or very few people are using it, why should I consider using it? Five-star ratings, the best out of any other architecture style, for those levels of abstraction, complex workflows that need to be managed, and also integration and interoperability. That, folks, is SOA's sweet spot. When you have lots of heterogeneous systems that all need to talk to one another, especially within a workflow or a particular request where I may have to go out to maybe a mainframe and then uh, C Sharp and then out maybe to some Java code and then finally give you your answer, this is a great architecture style for doing that. That enterprise service bus gives us that level of abstraction so that all of these systems can change and evolve independently from any other system because of that contract decoupling and protocol decoupling. That is its sweet spot. It is a great architecture style for those particular use cases. And this is mostly in, for example, large companies like large insurance companies, maybe even large banks. However, there are even more use cases when not to use SOA. <laughs> As you can see from the star ratings, um, one of the other factors that led to kind of getting off of that hype curve and saying, you know, this is not such a great thing, were all of the budget, time, and cost overruns that most companies encountered when trying to implement service-oriented architecture. It's very complex and very expensive. And consequently, those time overruns in terms of trying to get things out fast, whether they be new functionality or changes, simply took too long. 
If you think about all of the various users and stakeholders involved with any given single request, we had business users, enterprise, uh, enterprise shared services teams, application teams, infrastructure teams, all these folks trying to coordinate to make a change and to make sure that change isn't breaking things because of that reuse was really that other piece that kind of led service-oriented architecture to come down that hype curve. Also, one of our other lessons learned, it was slow. Abstraction was great, but as you increase levels of abstraction, generally you decrease performance. And all the layering of different kinds of services was one of the other lessons learned about some of the dangers of service-oriented architecture. So is SOA dead? No, no, it's not. Uh, many of us would like it to be dead, but no, it's a viable architecture style um, just to be wary of some of the deficiencies and to make sure that if you do have some problems of heterogeneous interoperability, of disparate heterogeneous systems and need that level of abstraction, that's what service-oriented architecture provides you. So this has been lesson 126. Is SOA dead? No, not quite. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that lesson. Stay tuned in two more Mondays for another lesson in Software Architecture Monday.